perhaps the most memorable encounter I've had with anyone. But like ultimately, if you if you force me to make a decision, I care more about revenue retention than anything, because revenue retention is a function of your customers who cancel, your customers that go delinquent, you know, delinquent churn, and then the expansion revenue that you have. And this gets to the adage of your current customers should spend more with you. Their average order values should go up over time. In an SaaS environment, that means they're adding add-ons, they're upgrading to new plans. In a you know, D2C environment, that means they're using more products, they're on the subscription, and then they're buying additional product you know, every single month mm-hmm. in, in a very simple way. Welcome to the Own Your Commerce podcast, where leading experts, brands, and innovators reveal strategies for e-commerce growth. I'm your host, Jay Myers, and this show is brought to you by Bold Commerce. Welcome to this week's episode of Own Your Commerce. I've been trying to track down our guest today for a few weeks, maybe maybe a little over a month, I'm not sure, but I finally got him here. It's Patrick Campbell. He's the CEO of ProfitWell. A lot of you may have heard of his company. It's been growing quite well lately. We've done a little bit of work with similar clients. We've been on webinars together in the past and this guy knows his stuff when it comes to pricing, churn, LTV, and I would say pretty much everything that matters when it comes to building a sustainable, profitable company. I actually, I read a quote, Patrick, from, I think this is your quote. I don't know if you call it a quote or a stat. <laughs> <laughs> One of your eBooks, it said, growth is more revenue, not more customers. You made a statement that out of a whole bunch of companies you studied, out of Every 10 blog posts, seven were focused on acquisition, two were focused on retention, and only one was focused on pricing. So today, that's that one. We're here to talk about pricing, LTV, churn, and so welcome to the show. (laughs) and Thanks for being here. Yeah, excited to be here. I think if I added anything to that, it would be... Something along the lines of like, you know, growth is actually, you know, about relationships, you know, the beauty of like the subscription model, but I would argue, you know, most of our businesses is that, you know, the relationship is baked right into how you make money. And if you have a great relationship, you obviously acquire the the customer, you monetize them, you retain them, and, you know, they keep spending money with you into the long term. So that's what it's all about. That's great. I love that. I want to dive into some of that right away. Just really quickly for people listening, can you give us a little bit, what is ProfitWell? really quick and and who are you and why did you build that company? Yeah, so we're all about what's called subscription revenue automation. So basically you plug in your billing system and your subscription management system and then we do a bunch of fun things. We give you free metrics. So we have the most accurate subscription financial metrics on the market and we give that away for free. It's used by, you know, depending on how you measure it, about 20% of the entire subscription market, which is cool. And then on top of that, the way we make money is we have a couple of different products that you know, automate either retention. So we're really good at recovering failed payments, really, really good at, you know, helping upgrade people to longer term contracts. And then we have some products that focus on pricing, which, you know, I know is a big topic for today. And that was actually our first product is, you know, getting into the, the world of pricing. That blog post you referenced, that's that's quite, quite a couple of years old. So I'm, I'm glad you <laughs> did your research and dug that up. Do you know exactly which one it's from? So we, we do a lot of content and we try to publish a lot of data and studies because it's just more interesting and it's also where we can, you know, provide a strength. And yeah, that one's from something along the lines of, you know, we studied 10,382, I don't know what the exact <laughs> or give or take. blog posts on growth and here's what we found. And that was basically the stat that you gave. Well, it was a great post. I actually didn't just read it prior to today. I remember reading that a couple of years ago when you, when you published it. It actually made its rounds around our office at Bold. Just prior to date, like I remembered reading it, so I kind of searched and pulled it back up. This might have been before it was ProfitWell. It was Price Intelligently. Is that still a product you offer? Is now everything under the ProfitWell umbrella? It's all ProfitWell. It's all ProfitWell. All the time. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> that's uh, yeah. We still have the brand called Price Intelligently, but it's by ProfitWell essentially. I got gotcha. you. Why did you want to build this company? Like, what was your motivation to do this? Well, to be honest, it was pure hubris. So I, I started my career. I worked in U.S. intelligence in D.C. I worked at Google, so these giant entities, and I was basically a, an econ analyst. I kind of decided that you know a large company just wasn't wasn't what I wanted, and you know I always had that. I'm, I'm from the Midwest, so I'm in, I'm from Wisconsin, which is you know why your your Canadian accent might bring out my Wisconsin <laughs> accent here. In a Blend bit. right but in. Basically, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But basically, I, I always had that mindset of 
you know, work really, really hard and care really a lot about your work. And I always found myself, you know, and this is an unfair interpretation, but I always felt, you know, I care more than my boss. Like, why isn't my boss moving as fast as I am? Why aren't they like getting out of the way so that, you know, we can accomplish whatever this goal? And that's why it's hubris because I think I was just like a punk kid, you know, who's ambitious, but didn't realize that, you know, some things take time or some things, you know, are bigger than what you think it is. And so I ended up working for another company, actually, the DDC brand called Jimvara. And uh, they did customizable jewelry, kind of like Blue Nile. Basically, I was really enamored by you know the startup world and, and kind of building a business. And I wasn't really enamored with the culture there. You're starting to see kind of a theme. And so I, uh, I basically jumped out and you know I was in my mid-20s. And it was one of those things where I thought, you know, thankfully, I didn't have any big debts or liabilities, which you know, I can't say the same for a lot of my peers just because of you know, what's happened in the U.S. education system. But I was thankfully in that position. And I said, I'm cheating myself by not trying. And I never really wanted to be in business. Like I never wanted to be an entrepreneur, but started the company. And, you know, seven years later, we're cranking and, you know, building, building something great, at least in my opinion. Well, there's a mythical folklore out there Uh that you have been around companies going public and not even properly understanding their MRR and their data around their customers. Is this true? Yeah, so we, that's funny. It's funny you brought that up. I get invited to a lot of like boardrooms. I'm not on the board, but I at least get invited to talk because, you know, of the work that we do on the pricing side and also just the amount of data that we're seeing. And so I've probably been in more SaaS and subscription boardrooms than most people as an observer, just because, you know, we're kind of that analyst side of the house. But what's kind of funny is that's that's kind of where the idea for the metrics product came, like kind of our core free product that we have is we were helping a company that was about to IPO with their pricing. You know, they had a CFO who had taken two other companies public. This was his third. And he was calculating both MRR, monthly recurring revenue, and churn uh, completely incorrectly. And, you know, sometimes there's different definitions people have. Even by his definition, they were being calculated incorrectly. And so, you know, we thought we had this, you know, multi-billion dollar idea of, oh, we're going to sell this analytics product, which is like famous last words for any entrepreneur because analytics is just a terrible, terrible market to be in. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what started the rolling down of that product. I guess you would know, right? Eventually (laughs) it... Yeah, yeah, we we did our price testing and we were so excited and then all of a sudden the pricing research came back and we were like, oh no, uh-huh. like no one's willing to pay for analytics even if they're large companies and, and this is why most of those companies go up market because they need like big sales teams and they need to sell for a very, very high price because you know it's really hard to play the volume game. Some people have done it, but the subscription space, not sure if you know this, but even including subscription e-commerce, subscription media, subscription software, it's only about 150,000 companies. So we're not talking about the e-commerce space where there's millions you know, of different leads. Not all of them are created equal, obviously, but we're talking about a smaller market from a logo perspective. You know, The revenue on those logos are, are, are you know, astronomical, and that's why we're still in the space that we're in. But yeah, that's, that's what kind of led us to this thesis around subscription revenue automation. Crazy. Okay, I had like six questions that come from that there, but I'm trying to pick up <laughs> one. I guess the first one I want to touch on is churn I could understand. So this company going public, churn sometimes is is a little bit, like MRR to me seems like such a straightforward thing to understand. But churn is actually, you can get different definitions. You can talk to five different companies how they define it. Yeah. And it's different. And what's your definition of the proper way to, let's keep this within the realm of uh, subscription <laughs> commerce, I guess, to calculate churn? Yeah. So I want to first, before we get there, MRR actually isn't as straightforward as you would think. Okay, maybe and a step back. Yeah. The reason, yeah, yeah, the reason for it is, and this is what we thought. We're like, oh, this should be easy, right? And everyone needs this, so that's the billion dollar idea. Here's the problem, is that when you look at, let's say, any you know, payment system, subscription management system, you know, really just any subscription company, you're getting a lot of data in, and anytime there's an upgrade, you have to make some decisions around prorating. Do you prorate? Do you not? When does that MRR count? You got time zones. You have currencies. You know, if you're an international company, and then you multiply this by multiple different edge cases times ten thousand customers or even a thousand customers, and understanding what your MRR is is actually really, really difficult. And that's what made building the metrics product so frustrating. Is that it actually took a lot of work, and we we first started building on top of Stripe, and it took a lot of work to just handle the, you know, now we have over 1,500 edge cases that we're handling for Stripe alone. 
And it took a long time to get to accuracy. But what we discovered is that if it's not accurate, people don't care and people aren't willing to, you know, basically buy the product. And so what's really just kind of fascinating about that is, is, is that's the frustration with analytics products. It's actually really, really hard to do analytics right, but people still don't appreciate it because they're just like, oh, this is just graphs. And this is why we move to revenue automation because people care about their revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, long story short, I think it's it's one of those things that, you know, if you're a really basic business, you got 100 customers, it's super, super easy. But, you know, if you're a business of any size and you're starting to think about, hey, I got to make this decision. If I end up being 5% off in my metrics, that could be multiple full-time employees, if not, you know, a whole division at the right size where it's like, oh no, we, we don't have the right number of people. And it turns out we could have spent that money, but our numbers were off. So yeah, that's what gets, sorry to go on my soapbox. No, box fair there. enough. Uh, and I guess at those the point things. that a company is going public, like, yeah, if they're in multiple geographies and multiple currencies, fair enough. It definitely, I can see the complexity of calculating it and how that could, how that could be an issue. Yeah, no worries. And then in terms of churn, really, I mean, the most basic definition is, you know, revenue that canceled or like lapsed, you know, went delinquent and and turned and basically canceled out over a period over the total revenue up for renewal over that period. And so you can do it at, so on a monthly basis, it's like, you know, how many customers do we have at the beginning of the month? It's the BOM or beginning of the month, you know, number. And then that's under the number of folks who canceled during that period, essentially. And that's the most basic definition. There's actually, I don't know, we cataloged this at one point. We cataloged 43 different ways to calculate churn. I think that if you're not about to go public or you're not like over $100 million in revenue, you should just use the most basic definition. And then as you get over that, you start to want to qualify your churn a little bit. You know, just because, you know, if I'm Blue Apron, right? You should not be looking at my churn the way that you look at, you know, Zoom, the SaaS company, right? This was what always was frustrating for me when you're seeing the reporting when Blue Apron went and, and went public is they're like, oh, well, the churn, the churn. It's like, th- these are way different things. Like, we know Blue Apron or any, like most box of the month clubs, they're going to have massive churn in that first month. And that's just going to happen because they're so good at acquiring leads and customers that not everyone's going to be perfect, but that's actually a strength because they're putting a lot of stuff through that funnel from a brand perspective. And then a lot of those folks are coming back later. And that's why, to me, and I actually don't know what Blue Apron officially does at this point, but to me, for Blue Apron, you should start looking at churn starting second month or third month and then measuring like the drop off from there. Because as you'll notice, with a lot of you know, subscription food companies, at least that we, we found in our data, is that's when things are actually pretty stable because you found those classic customers or those customers who are going to stick around for a long time. And so that's what it gets into when you want to make it a little more complicated is you want to measure something that's actually going to be useful for you. And sometimes the most basic measure just isn't good enough. The, well, there's a few things that come into play there. And we are a SaaS company and we look at there's trial there's what we call drop off, which is before a customer activates. And then activation is when they start paying. But basically, what you're saying is for like Blue Apron, those customers, even though they've maybe paid the first month, they aren't really an activated customer. Yes, they paid, but there's almost like a second activation where they've had it for a month. They like the food and they pay a second month. Where with software, you can make that decision a lot sooner. Like with Zoom, I can use it three times, decide, yeah, this is a good platform for video conferencing. I'm going to use it. I don't need to actually pay for it, try it. So that's why I think that first month drop-off is going to be so high where you're right, it's different metrics. The thing that I caught when you said there is, you mentioned the first time you mentioned revenue drop-off and then the second time customer drop-off. And where do you see the difference there? Like, and what should you measure? Is it really just revenue drop off compared to revenue added? Is it customer drop off or is it a combination? Yeah, I mean, it's different. It really kind of depends, right? Like ultimately, if you if you force me to make a decision, I care more about revenue retention than anything. Because revenue retention is a function of your customers who cancel, your customers that go delinquent, you know, delinquent churn, and then the expansion revenue that you have. And this gets to the adage of your current customers should spend more with you. Their average order values should go up over time. And in a SaaS environment, that means they're adding add-ons, they're upgrading to new plans. In a you know, D2C environment, that means they're using more products, they're on the subscription, and then they're buying additional product you know, every single month mm-hmm. in, in a very simple way. And I think that what ends up happening is 
Too many people get caught up in the the churn number when it comes to logos, so customers. Logo is a very B2B term, but really it's number of customers. And the problem there is that you obviously can't create new customers. That number is always going to be bad. You know, there's never going to be over 100%. But what I actually want to look at, and what I think is more important, is I want to look at the different stages of my revenue churn. So I want to look at that first or second month like we talked about. Then there's another period right after that. And then there's like the long tail when people seem to be, you know, basically a customer for the long term. And when I look at those three stages, there's different things that I would do to optimize those different stages. And I might decide if I'm Blue Apron, hey, that first stage, there's nothing we can do because we're just sending tons of like maybe not so qualified leads who are signing up for this promotion. So that's not our path of, best leverage. But the second period of like why people drop off between one and three months, if I improve that even marginally, all of a sudden it has big gains in that third stage, right? There are times when I would want to look at the customer number and that just, you know, comes down to is my product actually compelling no matter the tier or no matter the plan that someone signs up with. But in reality, the thing I need to optimize is that revenue retention, which in the early days in a business, in the early days being like the first 10 years, it can be really hard to figure out who is that beachhead customer that you just go out and automatically get. And I think that that a lot of people, they focus a little too much on that too early when there's just so many different factors. And that's why revenue retention, which compounds a lot more, I think is so much more crucial. And this is why you see some companies posting these negative churn numbers where they're actually, it's opposite because their existing customers are becoming more valuable and they're adding new customers. They're losing customers, but net revenue is is actually increasing month over month. Yeah, exactly. And I think negative churn is kind of, just because it's hard to understand, a lot of people stop using it. It's more like net revenue retention. So it's like, you know, is your net retention over 100%? Like for some reason, you know, people can, like if I put a dollar in at the beginning of the year, how many dollars do I expect to get at the end? And hopefully that number is more than one. It's interesting. Whenever you hear negative churn, that's what's happening. So can we take a step back a little bit on the churn topic, kind of looking at like philosophically, why do customers churn? So like for all of our subscription customers listening right now, and there's a lot of them, they sign up, they pay, and then they unsubscribe. What's your philosophical thinking on why people churn? Yeah. I feel like you have some thought on this. Yeah, yeah. It depends like how much time do we have, right? (laughs) I think that the big thing to keep in mind is it all comes down to value, right? And this is the non-helpful, but the most truthful answer. So at the top, I you know described like subscriptions. It's all about relationships. When that person comes in, a lot of times, especially in the world of D 2 C, we're only thinking about that person starting the relationship. We're not doing nearly enough on the tail end. Even if you're not a subscription, we're not doing nearly enough with those people who have already purchased something and getting them to purchase more. In the world of SaaS, we think a little bit more about retention because that's a number that our you know, investors or advisors will ask us about. But in reality, the biggest thing you got to keep in mind is that relationship is more than just acquiring or starting the relationship. It's building that relationship and then ultimately it's monetizing that relationship. And so I think the big thing that you have to think about is when that relationship is ended by the customer, they're doing this evaluation every single month or every single term or maybe midterm, depending on you know kind of the relationship you have with them. Where they're looking at like, hey, are we still using that thing? Hey, are we getting value from it? And if someone's asking that question in finance or somewhere else, someone else needs to raise their hand and be like, yeah, yeah, we're using it and we actually love it, right? Because that person's like, oh, I'm getting value from it, right? Similarly on the D2C side, if I'm still getting value every single month from, you know, my, you know, who gives a crap subscription for toilet paper, you know, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, oh, that's awesome. I can continue to, you know, to use that product And ultimately, I can use that product because I'm getting the value from it. So, I mean, when you think from there, then there's a ton of different reasons. They couldn't get their question answered. You'd be surprised at how many people churn because of that. There's, hey, I just didn't see the value in the first month. And that's why you should probably try to give them a second month at a discount or something to try to keep that user into the long term. There's, I didn't like the product. Well, why didn't you like the product? What can we improve? Oh, you didn't see that we had that feature. Oh, you didn't see that this was the right way to cook the meal. That's something we can solve, right? And there's actually, you know, if you really think about it, there's different categories, but there are just many paper cuts of why someone would churn. And this is why looking at that particular active churn bucket, people actively canceling, 
is so crucial to your product or your fulfillment or your growth team, depending on who it is. Now, there's other pieces of churn. So the one other major piece, and I've alluded to it before, are payment failures. And Mm. what's really interesting is this is the largest single bucket. So in a D2C environment, it's probably about 40% of your churn. And there's high variance there. So some people it's much more and some people it's much less. B2B, it's probably closer to about 30%. Wow. So meaning if you have 100 people churn, 30 to 40 of them are basically because of failed credit cards, which I know sounds ridiculous, but it's just because credit cards are mechanical devices that are subject to failure. And in that sense, you know, a lot of times you do have some percentage of people, that's just their excuse to basically, you know, give up on the subscription. But probably about eight out of 10 of those folks, they're able to get them back. They're able to to basically be a a subscriber again, but they just didn't even know that their credit card failed. Mm -hmm. And so what I typically recommend to folks is just understand like the makeup of your churn. And then make sure you're collecting data on the active churn so you can fix those things and realize it's not like, boom, in one quarter, we're going to solve this thing. It's something that's a game of inches or centimeters, you know, up there in Canada um, in order to- <laughs> And to the rest of the get world. Those, you know? <laughs> get those folks back. No, I was going to say, and, and the rest of the world, I think it's us and one other country. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's a small country in the Caribbean. So yeah, it makes sense. But yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's like, that's why people churn is they don't see value. Yeah. And not seeing value can be- so many intentional and unintentional things. So are there any early warning signs that, so obviously when someone churns, that's a sign that they don't see value, but how can stores prevent that? A, how could they see it coming? Or B, what are some ways, creative ways you see some of your customers making sure that value is perceived? Because I think it is, it's a perception. There might be the value there, but the customer has to perceive it. Yeah, and I think that not to use like a way overused metaphor, but it really comes down to like, think of like how you would start a relationship with like another human, right? Like not necessarily romantic or anything because that's the overused metaphor, but just like a friendship or something like that Mm -hmm. or like a business contact. You know, there's a bunch of different things that you would do, right? Mm -hmm. Like you greet the person, you say, hey, I would love some, some feedback on this blog post I wrote and you seem to be an expert on it. Or, you know, you do a whole host of these things. And then when we get into business, all of a sudden we're like, oh, like we become these like sterile human beings that don't have any emotions, right? And I know that's not necessarily the case with a lot of stores because there's a lot of branding done, but you got to treat your customers as that relationship that you're building. So asking for feedback, and if you ask it sincerely, it seems like so simple, but it's like, oh, you're going to ask for my feedback and then you're going to listen and maybe respond to it. Like, those are the support tickets that, you know, typically support teams love to deal with because ultimately those are the ones that aren't just like, hey, where's my package? Can I get a refund? These types of things, right? Right. Even then, like making sure that you're basically, you know, training your support team to understand like, hey, why? Oh, you want to cancel? Like why? Or you want a refund? Why? Right? And then making sure that they empathize and there's so many opportunities to save it because they might be like, oh, I got the wrong color. And it's like some support teams, they're just like, cool, refund it. When they should be like, oh, what color did you want, right? And then like send that out and send a note. Like those handwritten notes, I know like everyone's using them, but they work. That's a reason. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of look at some of these tactics and just think about, okay, like how am I going to build this relationship? And then if there's something that's overused, how am I going to build that relationship in a way that kind of breaks the mold, right? And there's a lot of tactics and I don't know if you want me to go deep on that, but like I think that's the biggest thing is just making sure that you're building that relationship. That's so good. I see it as like you set the table and this is the to play on your relationship analogy. It's like if you're going on a date and you make the table, you put all the cutlery out. This is like you do everything totally. to woo the customer in. You make it all nice. You have dinner. They buy what <laughs> they, they eat with you, but then you never talk to them after and you don't nurture that relationship and you don't build it at all. It's like, why go to all that work? Yes. What are you doing? That yeah. is what a lot of stores do. And and then they wonder, well, why, are, why is their retention so bad? Yeah, and I don't think it's overused. And I don't think it's bad to say it because it's a true thing about doing, you're doing business with people. You're not doing it with a hit on your site, right? So, and now more than ever, that's true. And something else you made me really think about that, something I think about a lot, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is I think there's a ratio of some sort of, the value that the customer has to perceive to what they're paying. And I don't know what it is, but this is my theory. You can poke holes in it. But if you're subscribing to, let's just say shampoo, and it's 20 bucks a month or something, and then after a couple months, you 
I don't know why you wouldn't see value in it anymore, but you decide you don't see value in it anymore and you cancel your shampoo subscription. Or maybe it's stacked up for a couple of months because you were away and, and it's, you, you go and you cancel it. But that's a one-to-one value ratio. Like you're paying $20, you're getting a $20 bottle of shampoo. But I've seen stores do such creative, I call it value stacking, where they partner with a company where every month, because they're a subscriber, they get a 20% discount at these three other brands. They get access to special discounts on their site. They get access to content on their blog about hairstyling or whatever it is. And it's like this four or five to one ratio. They're getting like $100 worth of value, which doesn't cost the store $100. They find creative ways to deliver that value. And then so when you're going to think about canceling it, it's like, why would I ever cancel this $20 bottle of shampoo? That means I'm going to miss out on my, you know, and maybe every second month I get a free offer for a half off of some other product, but I have to be a subscriber to get that. Or So my theory is there's some sweet spot of value ratio and if a store can hit that, I think that they would really help churn, not eliminate it. But anyways, that's my theory. Yeah. In theory, you're totally right. I think the, the thing you got to think about is, and you kind of alluded to this with value stacking, it's sometimes more things can increase value. Other times higher quality can increase value. And then there's like, you got to think about everything that goes into to, to willingness to pay, right? Everyone thinks it's just the price. And it's like, well, what is the reflection of a price? Your price is the exchange rate on the value that you're providing. So you're basically saying like, it's this much value and here's the price. Now, if I'm a consumer and I feel like I'm getting a deal, right? And this is where discounts can sometimes come into play if I'm a discount brand or you know something like that. I might be saying, oh, this thing is normally worth $100 and you're giving it to me for 50. Oh, I feel like I'm cheating the system in a good way or I feel like I'm getting something, right? Now, the other thing is, is if I buy something, this is going to make me sound like, not a lot of people know me on this, I'm sure, but it's going to make me sound like a little bit foofy. So like, you know, I'm in the Midwesterner in me is like, I don't want to give this example, but one of the nicest thing I own is, is an Eames lounge chair. Mm. So an Eames lounge chair is really well designed. I was like, I want to buy a nice piece of furniture. Everything else is Ikea. That's the one thing I got in the house. And it's, you know, it's, it's thousands of dollars, but it has this like, it has this design element. It has this cultural element. It has this sophistication to it. So all of a sudden, it's not about the money. It's just about like, oh, I'm going to get this really, really cool thing, right? And I have this, this inflated sense of self because I own this Eames lounge chair, even though I'm sometimes embarrassed by how much I spent on a chair. And that's part of the value too, right? Exactly. And so that's what I'm trying to get at is there's all these things. There's the thing that you're selling, and then there's everything around it. Now, if you increase the number of things, that increases the value. If you increase the quality, that increases the value. But if there's the brand and the culture and the word of mouth and the referrals and all these other things, all of a sudden value goes up. And that's why like, I personally think we're going to live in a world at some point where the price for you know referred traffic, like an actual referral from another human being, the price for that particular product should be higher than the price that someone found me through SEO. I really think that that's the future because that perception is so different and we should take advantage as, as operators of that perception and everyone's still happy, right? And this is why I'm not a big fan of like just, you know, huge discounts on the front of the website unless you are a discount brand and that's what you're known for because I think you just diminish the value from the people. You know, there's some people who look at the discount and like, oh, it must not be good. You know, if it's 50% off, it must not be good, right? It's that value matrix and, and the easiest thing to do here just to kind of round out this point is rather than doing some of these tactics we're talking about is just, have something for each of the profiles you're selling to. The basic utility person who just wants the, you know, straight up, you know, like whatever you're selling, the shampoo. Then you got the the premium version, the person who wants to get the add-ons or maybe the fully organic or the fully, you know, natural or whatever it ends up being. And then you got the luxury line for those hardcore folks. And a lot of people, they only start with the utility part or maybe the premium part. And it's like you, plenty of people that are willing to pay a heck of a lot more if you just offered them something that was higher quality or was a bigger bundle. So I think that's kind of how you have to think about it. And then some of those other value drivers, they're hard to, to really hone in on, but that just means that they're important. It's interesting you mentioned the customer referral because specifically for subscriptions, that's, I think it is the number one, and it depends on obviously not every brand's the same, but it's the number one driver of subscription signups is a, ref- a referral from a friend. Yep. Because more than anything with a subscription, I feel like you're 
you're you're subscribing to the company or the brand. Like if I buy a product one time, I've actually bought products where I've searched online, I've searched in Google, and I've I can't remember what it was. I think it was a camping stove. And I anyways, I I bought it and then a couple of weeks later it didn't come. And for the life of me, I couldn't remember the company I bought it from. <laughs> Like I was on the site and I bought it and I was trying to search my email to find a tracking number and I couldn't remember the company I bought it from. So I, I was not buying from that brand at all. But I can't imagine ever subscribing to a company and that happening because you're buying into the brand. So it's so much more a referral from friends that I'm sure some signups come through SEO, but friend referrals are the number one. So that's even more relevant to your point. Yeah, totally. I want to ask... A little bit about pricing, because this, I can't remember where I heard you talking about this. It might have been on a webinar or some other podcast, but I know you have a lot of thoughts around pricing models and freemium, annual billing, usage billing. And we can speak to like all different spectrum. It doesn't have to be like e-commerce subscriptions, although like I, I feel like e-commerce subscriptions are ripe for a bit of a a change, like the standard subscribe and save model. Everyone does that and it works fine. But correct me if I'm wrong, you're on the camp of you like the the freemium model you think is a, a, I think I heard you talking about this before. Yeah. What's your thoughts around this? Yeah, I used to be very against freemium actually. So, um, and it's kind of like a religious topic, especially in the the world of like retail, right? Because, or e-commerce, because you're sitting there and you're like, why would I give something away for free, right? And in some cases, like, you know, Blue Apron and some of the like plated, some of the other, you know, subscription food folks, they tried giving away free food. And I think there were some legal issues with that, but even then, like it just didn't work. And I think that the thing that I would encourage you to kind of think about as an e-commerce brand is, what you're trying to do with a freemium model, and, then, and I'll get into some ways that an e-commerce brand can take advantage of this, is you're basically trying to lower the activation energy of a prospect, a prospective customer, mm. to starting to engage and get washed over with your brand, right? Mm. And the reason for this is that customer acquisition costs, no matter the channel, are up like just up across the board. So if you look at, you know, most D2C brands, you know, you're using obviously the big, big few, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, maybe you have some long tail, some other places, but, you know, TikTok, we'll see, I'm sure it'll be, you know, lucrative at some point. But what's kind of fascinating about it is that these four or five channels, they've been around for a while and we haven't had major new ones with the exception of TikTok in a long time. And now there's just, Everyone and their their brother and sister has you know a D two C brand or a new product or you know the drop shipping world that's you know a little more nefarious you know down down on the the bottom end. But the thing is, is like how do you stand out? Well, I think Glossier did a brilliant job without even really thinking about it. They were doing this more for feedback. They were just like, hey, we want to create the right products. But inadvertently, what they did with freemium or with community was essentially create like almost like a freemium plan, you know, not in the traditional sense where those folks were a part of the process. They were able to be a part of this community. And then all of a sudden that increased not only the betterment of the product, but it also increased essentially what happened with the average order values, the lifetime value of those customers, etc. And so what gets really, really kind of fascinating is I think if I was an e-commerce brand today, I would start a membership. I would have a free membership. And then in addition to that, I would have a paid membership, you know, or just do like one of them. I think the reason I like a paid membership is there's some some implications from a lifetime value as well as like a revenue perspective. But a membership is kind of your gateway to a free plan. Now, what is in your free plan? What is in this membership? There's a lot of things, but like content is literally the easiest thing to provide. A lot of these folks, they're already consuming your content on Instagram or wherever it is. You know, have some premium content. If you're a beauty brand, have like some, hey, here are some beauty tips or here are some things that you should look at or some tutorials or these types of things. But just start getting people to engage with your brand, your email list, et cetera, and engage in a little bit more way or a little bit more commitment than they currently are by just looking at your content on social. There's other things you can do for free. I think that folks like most brands, but especially like ButcherBox and some of these folks, like, hey, if you sign up today, you get free bacon for life and these types of things. Those aren't necessarily like free plans. Those are more just like free incentives. And I would always do that over providing a discount. I would always, always, always provide something physical over a discount. It could be old inventory. I think that's what some people don't realize. They're like, oh, my inventory's old. I can't give that away or I can't like sell that right now. It's like, cool. 
give it away. Like, hey, anyone who signs up gets this you know, thing in addition to the core product. And I think that's one of those things that not only helps kind of clear that inventory, which is probably costing you money depending on how you look at it, but it also increases that conversion because you're increasing the value of the thing that your person is getting. So hopefully there's some good thoughts there that, you know, that are helpful for folks. Yeah, because man, think about like, okay, so ButcherBox, like if they, whatever their box is, if it's $39 and they're giving away free bacon for life with it, what's the bacon cost? Let's just say $4 hypothetically. If they had a subscribe and save, you save 10%, like you're not going to be, you wouldn't even be telling me the story right now. You wouldn't even be saying, Jay, ButcherBox, if you subscribe, you get 10% off for life. Like that's, there's no, there's nothing to write home about there. <laughs> yeah, totally. Even if it's the equivalent. Exactly. Yeah. Being a little bit creative and doing something can cost the same and, and people will spread the word. They'll post it on Instagram. They'll talk about it, but no one's going to go raving to all their friends. Like I saved 5% and man, it just says a lot so much for being a little creative. You're right. Like instead of just offering discounts, do something in a way that people will want to share it with their friends. Like I love it. Free bacon for life. I think there was something you said there that I loved. I love get them in and then wash them. What do you say? Wash them in your brand. Wash them with your brand. Yeah, I don't know why. I <laughs> no, that. it's good. I love it. I, someone, I, I, there was a, there's a big brander. I can't remember her name, but this is kind of what she said of like, you know, it's kind of like, oh, they're signing into something that looks, you know, like your brand. They're receiving emails that looks like your brand. And it's like, you know, provide those little touch points that they can start to associate you with the emotion or the thing that you want them to associate you yeah. with. And then it just becomes easier and easier to convert folks, especially because, you know, multi-touch is, is a big thing. Like, unless you're selling a utility, it's like, oh, I heard about it on the podcast. I heard that, you know, that ad. And then, oh, I checked out the website. And then like a week later, I like heard it again on the podcast ad. And I was like, oh yeah, let, let me go convert. Like, that's how the, the last couple of D2C products that I bought, that's basically how I heard about them. And I also like liked the podcaster. And I was like, oh, like, I've never bought something like that. Like, I'm just going to go buy it. I'll use their code. And all of a sudden now, like I'm subscribed to Magic Spoon Cereal, right? And like, I get this damn cereal every month. You know, that, that's good and it's great. But it's just one of those things that, you know, I, I never would have done this unless like there was some branding involved with it. Yeah. So then once you get them on graduating through the freemium out of the pricing, where do you stand on, on billing just by frequency? There's a lot of data around people looking at annual billing. Does it make a difference? Like, is churn better for people doing annual billing? Yeah, hundred percent. Typically, in both B two B and D two C, you're looking at churn is about thirty to thirty five percent better. Um, it's actually closer to like forty and almost fifty percent better in some D two C brands for an annual customer versus a monthly. Well, and if you think about it, it's because they're committing to one purchasing decision versus twelve purchasing decisions a year. And I think, it, I mean, if you look at a lot of D two C brands, like their average number of months is like six to seven. And this is still doing like a 20% discount because they're paying annually or like two months free or something like that. Well, yeah. And that's where I go back to some of the things we were just talking about is I think that that's like, if you think about, you know, an e-commerce brand, unless like there's some huge added value because you're doing a bundle and you figured out how to like get the bundle at volume and things like that, 20% could be your entire margin, right? So I don't think that that's, necessarily the decision for a lot of D2C brands. If you're doing like a membership or maybe a fitness product or something like that, that's a little bit more content-based. Like I can totally see you doing that. But I think for a lot of D2C brands, this is where the bacon stuff comes into play. It's like, hey, if you sign up for the annual plan, we'll give you bacon each month, right? And what that does is like there's an incentive and it gives and gets depending on what you're giving. Like I love using old inventory for this. I think it makes so much sense, but it's also not even trying to necessarily get them on the annual plan it's okay to offer quarterly plans and, and every six month plans. Now those aren't going to have as big of an impact as annual plans, but every every little centimeter here counts, you know, in terms of reducing churn. And what I will say though, and this is like very much in the data, offering up something physical, whether it's some old inventory, the bacon, or number of months off, those all work so much better than offering an equivalent percentage. And the reason is, is because if I'm just looking at 20% off or two months off, it's one of those things that I know what two months is. I can conceptualize two months. 20%, unless you're working in data all the time, I can understand that, but it takes me some extra seconds to like really visualize and conceptualize that. 
And so it's one of those things that like, they've done these studies for a long time. I think JC Penney, you know, RIP, they did this back in like the 20s where, you know, they actually set up like two bins. One was two for one and one was two for 50% off, which is the exact same price. And two for one, I think it, it basically, I think 40% higher pickup rate than, than the two for 50%. And we've seen this time and time again, and I can share, I, I don't have the data in front of me and I don't remember exactly what it looked like, so I don't want to speak to it. But we've seen this just time and time again be very, very positive in terms of, you know, kind of the uptick of, you know, annual plans, quarterly plans, and six month plans. Well, it makes sense. A percentage is one step further away from what the actual value is. There's that calculation between where it's, I've always noticed, we've done a lot of testing on with pop-ups, you know, you enter your email and you, to get a five or ten percent discount, changing that to a dollar, get five dollars off today or ten dollars off today converts drastically more than get five percent off. Even though, even though, like if your average ticket is one hundred and fifty, like five dollars might be less, it still converts better. Yep, one hundred percent. How do you price profit well? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> I think fairly well. So. We have the free product and we give that away for free for two reasons. One, it does help with our acquisition costs based on some of the freemium stuff we talked about. I think the more important part is we get a network effect, not only for referrals, but also a network effect from the data. So when we're studying all this data, we use it within our algorithms for our paid products. And our paid products, one of them are retained products. So this is the thing you can plug into your billing system and we reduce your churn automatically. I know that sounds too good to be true, but truly we call it an anti-active usage product. You don't have to like use it every day and it just it reduces your churn by attacking credit cards and attacking term and some of the things we've been talking about. The AAUP. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, that's completely pay for performance. So, you know, when you plug in the billing system, we're able to take like a three or six month average of your recovery rates, whichever one's higher. And then based on that, what we're able to do is essentially find out, you know, hey, we lifted it this much. And then we take, if you're an e-commerce brand, typically a CPA. And then if you're a SaaS brand, you know, basically we have some tiers, you know, based on the amount of revenue that we recover. So yeah, pay for performance is what we try to do. And then on the price intelligently product, because we're a little disconnected from the implementation, we're going to change that hopefully in the next year or so. What we do is we do have a pay for performance option, or you can pay, we do value-based pricing, which is, you know, if you're a larger company, the price is probably going to be higher than if you're a smaller company, just because the impact is higher. So you can pay based on like, basically the number of sprints or the amount of research we're doing, or you can pay for performance. And there's, you know, obviously an upside when it's performance for us. And then there's like more predictability, obviously, if it's, you know, just pay for the research and the amount of data we're collecting. We're getting close to our time here. And I want to do my lightning questions at the end. I'm going to ask one more question before we get into that, though. For a lot of brands who are getting into ah, subscriptions or any type of commerce, and they're looking at to enter the market at a price point, I mean, we've had experience actually raising the price on something and seeing more purchases, which goes against what you would think, but it's happened. And so my question is, is if you're coming into the market and you're not quite sure what price point you want to be at, you know you want to be either you're a premium or you're a bargain or you, know, you kind of have a rough idea. Do you recommend coming in low and inching up or coming in high and inching down or doing neither and doing something else? Yeah. No, it's a good question because I think that, you know, we didn't study econ enough uh, unless we studied economics in school. And so you're, if you remember your high school or college economics professor, you know, he or she, you know, showed you a demand, you know, a demand curve and was like, oh, as, you know, as the price goes up, demand goes down, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And I think that what you learn when you get into more advanced economics is that those curves, the reason they're called curves is because they're not actually straight lines. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even mm -hmm. though that's what they, they kind of showed you. And, What's interesting is, is in addition to that, online goods, especially software, but even in the world of like, you know, luxury goods, there's a world where, you know, as the price goes up, demand can actually go up, especially if you're measuring it through retention. And so I think that it's really, really important. This is why it's always frustrating when people have never done any research on the price. They anchor themselves and they think, oh, we're only worth $50 a month. And it's like, have you ever tested that notion? Well, we kind of like raised our price from 45 to 50. Well, that doesn't mean you tested it. That just means you like stayed within like the same price point, basically. Don't get me wrong, an extra $5 a month for a bunch of customers is fantastic. But what if you're supposed to be $100? What if you're supposed to be $1,000, right? And in reality, it's probably you want the $100, the $1,000, and the $5,000 option, right? So I think that 
to me, you kind of have to look at your DNA. And what I mean by that is if you are a brand that, you know, is evoking luxury, I think of like supply. Patrick Adu is is basically doing premium razors and things like that. And in that case, you know, I always cringe a little bit when I look at the website and I finally became a customer, even though I got this big beard that you can't see on a podcast, obviously. <laughs> and when I look at that and I see, you know, he's got $100 and then he crosses that out and has like 89, it breaks my heart a little bit because I don't think that's actually converting more. And he might get some false positives, but I think he's a luxury brand. He should act like one, right? Mm-hmm. And so if, if your DNA is, hey, I'm luxury, or if your DNA is, I'm really good at attracting the mass affluent, people who have bigger budgets, more discretionary income, then you should price accordingly and then skim down. You can always provide a lower price product. But if you're really, really good at attracting a huge base of people, then maybe you start low, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if all things being equal, I always like to start high because I want to see the people who truly, truly have propensity to buy the product and are truly into the product. And then I could skim down in the market and decide where is my floor going to be. Maybe I don't go as low as $20, but maybe I have that $150 product and then I offer a $100 product and actually increases things. I think ButcherBox, I mentioned them before, I think they've done a really good job with this. I think their lowest plan is not even $100. I think it's $140 or $150 bucks a month. Hmm, wow. And they have like a $179 or a $200 a month plan as well. I mean, their whole thing is like hormone-free, really good, grass-fed, all that kind of stuff, beef. and so. When you have that and then you're charging only like 30 bucks or 50 bucks, like there's no way. I mean, there's probably a way, but I would just continue to question the quality of of that product. So that's the thing you got to think about is, you know, your price is a reflection of your value and your brand. And I think it's easier to start high, get those right customers, and then eventually come down. It's a lot harder to kind of expand up. Yeah. That was my thinking. Thank you for verifying it. Yeah, no worries. (laughs) (laughs) It puts your stake in the ground of where you are as a company and like, if Oakley or you know a sunglass company were to come in making their sunglasses twenty dollars, like there's no way they'd end up getting up to charging three hundred dollars. Like they have to start there. So, okay, well, I got a couple quick questions for you. Thank you so much for your time here. I like going to end off with uh, our little lightning round. I can't remember if I <laughs> sent these to you ahead of time or not. Surprise! So, let's see. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't have a quick answer, then no worries. But they're pretty easy. So first one is, uh, what's the biggest mistake? you see e-commerce stores making? Ooh, I already said it, but you're always going to spend half your budget, half your time, if not more, on acquiring customers because that's the name of the growth game. If you spent even a fraction of that time, even if just a little bit more while you're still spending all that time on your retention or on your monetization, your life becomes just so much easier. And just think of, you know, if you put people in and they don't stay, like that doesn't mean you're winning. That means you're just surviving. What's your favorite thing about your job? Oh, such a good question. I have never in the past seven and a half years been like, oh man, I got to go to work today. And I think that's really good. And I think what makes that work is the people that, you know, we've, we've kind of cultivated and nurtured here at ProfitWell are all like very good about getting their stuff done. And they're also just people I love to be around. And so that mixed with, you know, getting to do things that I love to work on just makes it, makes it amazing. Amazing. Considering you didn't work out at so many places before. <laughs> so yeah, it's <laughs> or I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> What's your favorite online store? Or if you can't think of one, the last place you bought something, but preferably your favorite online store. That's so hard because every time I go to a store, all I can do is like criticize it. Oh, they're all good. No, no, no not even, yeah, yeah. No, not that they're bad. <laughs> just all I can do is like, ah, oh, like, oh, they should do this or they should add this here. I got to introduce them to this person. I would have paid twice for this if you would have charged <laughs> more. <laughs> I don't know. I don't like to say that even though if I think it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a lightning round back. The last few things I bought, I bought a Whoop band. I don't know if you know that company, Whoop. No. D2C, I know it's like obviously e-commerce, but I feel like, you know, a a subscription fitness product should probably be in D2C as well as media. And I know some people, they mix those, some people they don't. But it's, it's basically this band that you wear and it actually, the battery life outlasts for five days and it's made for like hardcore athletes, but now all us regulars are starting to buy it. So $30 a month subscription, which seems like a lot compared to just buying an Apple Watch once, but the app and the experience is just so good. I bought Supply. I bought a Razor set from them. That experience was really, really good. The unboxing was just amazing. And then Magic Spoon I bought. And the Magic Spoon, what I love about it is 
their whole shtick is not only like the, the, the product is good, which I think is amazing, but they make it feel like, I don't know, I remember whenever my parents bought or let us buy like that box of bad cereal, like we never had bad cereal. Like the worst thing we had was like Honey Nut Checks or something like that, which was, you know, still a treat. But whenever they let us buy like Cocoa Puffs or something like that, like it was just such like Count amazing. Chocula. Yeah, it was such like, Fruit oh my Luke. gosh, yeah. like, you know, Cocoa Pops or Pops or whatever they're called. And it makes me feel like that. It's like, oh, this is like a little childhood, even though it's like mm. healthy keto cereal. So yeah, those are the last three things and, and kind of why I like them. I know that's definitely not answering your question, but... No, perhaps. that's awesome. And all three subscription brands, which is cool. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, this was kind of similar to the first one, but you might have a different take on it. What's the number one thing you think stores could be doing more of to grow sales, but aren't? So I'm going to go off the theme of retention. It's your existing customers should be spending more with you, even if they're subscribers get them to buy more products, get them to subscribe to more products, all those different things. You know, you already spent the money acquiring them, make them worth your while. Yeah, so good. Okay, last one. Most of our listeners are, they're business owners, they're entrepreneurs. You're a business owner, an entrepreneur. Do you have any, any favorite quotes, advice, or, you know, words of wisdom you've heard over the years from a friend about being a business owner? Oh my gosh, <laughs> so many things, right? <laughs> the one that just popped in my head though, and it's kind of cheesy, I was on a team in college and we would talk about daring to fail gloriously. And I think that a lot of us are really insecure as entrepreneurs for a whole host of reasons or, you know, because, but there's also just so much doubt because you're trying to literally create momentum from nothing. And I don't think enough of us appreciate how hard that is and how even just getting those first sales, let alone the 10 millionth sale is like so like hard and such an accomplishment. So I think it's just dare to fail gloriously because there's going to be a lot of failures, you know, on the way to, mm-hmm. to success and, you know, the only way to really succeed is to fail because you have to learn so much that you just didn't know. So I'll leave it at that and hopefully that inspires someone. I love it. Patrick, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks, brother. Thanks for having me. That's it for another episode of Own Your Commerce. If what you've heard has helped you in any way, I'd love it if you'd leave us a review in iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. It's a new podcast and reviews really help spread the word. And if you know someone you think that might benefit from this podcast, share it with a friend. If you'd like to learn more about Bold, visit boldcommerce.com. You can view all our past episodes. And if you have a story you'd like to tell, we'd love to have you on the show. You can apply to be a guest or suggest a guest on our website as well. That's all for now. And we'll see you next week. 